How y'all doing today? It's your man Fawn, Fawn Ness. On your social climate, welcome to the show. Yeah, I'd like to thank those of you guys who responded on my last video. You know what I mean? Uh, my man, Mandy Williams. What's up, quarterback coach? Greatest quarterback coach in the country, actually, right now. 100%. Um, but um, we talked about, in our last movie, what did we do? The Color Purple. Yeah, I had another movie I wanted to break down. I'm actually going to do a part two to that Color Purple also. Uh, there's you know some things I still wanted to hit and cover on that. I'm also, um, but uh, now, right now, what I want to give you guys is a different movie. Uh, I want to break down Django. You know what I mean? Uh, we're going to break down Django, and we're going to talk about that and a lot of the um, social dynamics you know, in that movie, you know, what was going on in that period and compared to what's going on now, uh, the relationships, so many relationships in that movie, relationships you had uh, between Django, the black man and the black woman. Then you had a relationship between um, Django and Schultz, you know, who was the dentist driving that dentist vehicle or whatever. Then you had a relationship between uh, Schultz and Mr. Candy, all right? The oppressor versus the... Uh, the guy who's uh, fighting for freedom and, you know, everyone to do their own thing kind of thing. So then you had uh, Broomhilda, right? And uh, and then you had interaction with her and Schultz, right? And then you had the butler, Stephen. You had interaction with Django and the butler, right? Broomhilda and the butler. So there was a lot of different dynamics in the movie, right? So... Uh, but I think the movie really, really, really had a big underlying plot, which was a game plan to kind of uh, pull the woman out of the matrix. What do I mean by that? The game plan to pull specifically the black woman in this movie, because this movie was all about race, many other things, but it was really about race too. Uh, to pull the black woman out of the matrix. Uh, what do I mean by that? Um, right now, if we look at today in comparison to what was going on then, I think the movie take, took place in 1858, right before slavery ended. Um, in that time period, uh, Broomhilda, the role she plays, she was uh, a house slave, so who could speak German. She had talents. And um, so she was kind of fitting in to that system more comfortably. I'm sure it was still miserable for the, for the house slave. By no means am I saying that any form of that is good, but she probably had a little better and um, fitting in better than Django, who was in the one part of the movie they said, you know, sell him cheap. I mean, sell that boy cheap, <laughs> right? So that movie was crazy. Um, but when you look at that dynamic, he wasn't fitting in. You know, he was like a field nigga. Excuse my term, my French, but, you know, that's what the movie was very graphic and kept it real about that time period. And so he was a field nigga. And um, he didn't fit in too well. So in today's times, you know, we have uh, the black woman who is very successful, doing her thing in society, a number one graduator of college, you know, fitting in right now, kind of looking at the black man like, come on, waiting for the black man to pick it up. He's a little bit on the outside looking in as far as like overall, not individuals, because there are many individually that are successful. But overall, society, where the men is still on the outside kind of knocking on the door in, in the matrix, into the system, uh, we're not fitting as well, you know, whereas the woman is. And so when you look at that, and you can refer that back to Django in that situation, you know, she, you know, was kidnapped. And he was going to go trying to get her out. You know, he was almost like on some finding himself black power type empowerment you know that movie was kind of really about Django empowering himself the whole movie he was empowering himself and being allowed to empower himself at that brother Schultz uh, the white man you know who was all about his business you know he was like man this money it's about this money I gotta get this money man if you know these these brothers you can help me find these brothers man we could you know get rid of them I'll drop you some money matter of fact you're doing this good you know, we can get into a little uh, a regular business for a while. And if you do business with me, I'll help you on something you need. So he was all about business. 
you know, regardless uh, of skin tone or color or race or anything like that. Um, so he still was a little wild, though, because um, he had to buy Django, you know, in the beginning. But um, <clears throat> he was more about business as when you first when you look at uh, some of the other characters in the movie. So looking at that dynamic, one of the first things that happened with Django, you know, um, about on him, you know, the movie kind of like was transcending uh, a time period where the black man was and woman was beginning to realize certain freedoms and do certain things that they'd never done before or that a white person had never seen them done, you know, where if they were done, they might have been hung or killed. So uh, one of the first things he did was, uh, you know, when uh, Schultz shot the guy and the horse was, you know, on the guy's leg, Django came over, you know, stepped on that horse. My man was screaming. That probably felt good. Like, man, all this, been walking on these chains, his ankles was all ate up and tattered, right? He went over and stepped on that horse, felt good. That man screamed. Then he grabbed his brother's coat, right? <laughs> he, man, he dropped his coat. Oh, by the way, media mob. I got a rep. Media mob. One left. So, um, threw that little blanket off, right? Back was tore up. Great visual. You know, all them dudes backs were tore up when they took those uh, blankets off. That shows that during the time period, everybody took lashes. There was no way to avoid one way or another, the system as a black man of doing something wrong, having to take them lashes. Uh, so he took his coat. That was the next thing he did. That was empowering. Normally, something like that during that time period, you'd be killed for stepping on that horse like that, and you'd have definitely been killed for taking a white man's coat. So these were two things he did to gradually empower himself. Okay, um, but the movie showed. All right. Uh, another thing he did. Right. He was riding on a horse. What the one dude say? He was like, that's a nigga on a horse. Nobody ever seen that, right? That's shocking. Like during that time period. And uh, and in the movie, when you heard that, it was like, wow. Like during that time period, that's really what they thought about us. And that's how they referred to us. Just that simple. So after that, right, he walks into the bar. He was like, boy, get out of here. Get him out of here. He wasn't even supposed to go in the bar, right? He walks in the bar. All right, then you have Schultz, who's kind of co-signing him, like, no, nah, he ain't going nowhere, All right? That was empowering, because you couldn't even walk into a place like that uh, back then, All right? Picks his own clothes. Many, many little, little things in this movie. Picks a bright outfit, right? Like, everybody's going to see me when somebody asks, why is he wearing that? Because I chose to, right? Even if it's flashy. Maybe that symbolizes a lot of reason why um, African Americans may want to dress flashy because maybe that's one of the few little things that they can control, you know, considering the economic situation that it might be in. I'm not saying it's right, you know what I mean? For real, for real. I'd rather give me some cheap shoes and some Jordans any day of the week, put that money in the bank, go on vacation. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, but um, anyway, he did do that. Okay, then now it starts to step it up a little bit. After he picks his own clothes, he kills. For the first time right and not only that but he killed the oppressors that uh, uh the brother that were beating him and his girl and caused them to be separated right he got some vindiction and in the movie showed a black man killing that guy those two guys on the plantation right in front of slaves in front of slaves unbelievable Right. So that movie was kind of depicting like um, the black man not being afraid anymore to fight for his rights through all the oppression that he's going through. You know what I mean? And the visible was powerful, powerful. And that's what I think that that scene right there meant in today's times. All right. Why right? he was whipping that man. Right. Took that whip that he had been whipped with from that scene on his back earlier. And was whipping that man and gave him about six, five shots to the dome piece. Right? Boom, 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 boom. That was powerful. Because um, a black man wasn't allowed to have a gun. Wasn't allowed to defend himself. Wasn't allowed to go after the persecutors, the people who had done wrong to him. All right? And then um, we move on from there. All right? The next part, I think, in the movie... They move on, all right, and uh, the plantation owner gets mad, right? They get their 
they make the clay the play on the um Ku Klux Klan stuff and they go and get their riders, right? They got their hoods and you know, they can't see nothing. They're trying to go after um these two, you know, Django and Schultz, but they, they can't even see. And it kind of makes a little fun on uh, the Ku Klux Klan a little bit there. And um but those guys, right? He even defeats and outwits the Ku Klux Klan. All right. Very, very powerful statement. And from there, uh, the guys with the uh, sheets or whatever decided they're going to go full regalia next time that they come out riding. All right. So during that time period, the Ku Klux Klan would have been very, very powerful. All right. So to kind of um, mo poke fun at them with this man empowering himself with a white man that's about his business, that's not concerned whether whether the person he's doing business with is black or white, he's just concerned about what's fair and what's right, right? And so uh, that was an interesting part of the movie. That's going to take more than just blacks. We have to do what we need to do, but then there have to be those who recognize and realize uh, how horrible the institution of um, physical slavery is done, but mental slavery and racism itself. And so it's going to take uh, whites and blacks together. So that was a powerful scene right there. All right. Um, then he gets a trophy uh, first for that first kill. Kind of remind me a little bit of uh, get out, you know, with the deer heads and all that kind of stuff, and um, and how we were trophies a lot of times as uh, African Americans. You know, our skin was used as boots and all this kind of stuff, and uh, gator bait. We were actually our babies were used as bait to catch alligators. It's, it's unbelievable. So. Um, when you see those little gators with the baby in the mouth, that's what that means. So for him to get a trophy uh, as his first bounty just kind of was uh, just represented kind of uh, killing in, the, in that aspect of what it does to you mentally. All right. Now, as far as like a lot of the different things that Django went through, he eventually got to the point where he had confidence enough to go up in that house and play the role of a black slaver, right? And then you had the scene with him and the black guy where he was on a horse. And that reminded me of, I guess, the groups they call the bourgeoisie and all these people who are becoming successful, you know, but to the poor black person, it looks like they're Uncle Sam or Uncle Tom or whatever that phrase is. It looks like they're trying to be in, you know, be with the Joneses and move on up. They don't care about their communities anymore, the poor. You know, meanwhile, on the other side, that person is just starting to get a little bit of money and starting to grind is like, I'm trying to make a way. I can't just be saying all these things and come down there and fight and be in the streets marching because they're going to take away my ability to get where I'm trying to go. I have a plan. And Django had a plan. You know, he wasn't really a snake, but he played that role. And then playing that role, he got to see you know, the different dynamics of how they pitch us against each other in class. When I say us, I'm not saying everybody. I'm just saying the system and the certain groups of elites and people who want to be racist and want to pitch different races amongst against each other. All right. So there's that dynamic. All right. All right. Another hidden uh, relationship. All right. Was between the butler and Django, all right? The butler could not stand the fact that Django came in riding on a horse. He was like, who is this uppity, this dude think he is coming in here? Only I have took the time. I earned the right to talk to master. And he got all close to master, making sure everybody saw how close he was and his relationship was with, with master, right? Master Candy, you know? But um, him and Django just didn't get along. Django's that young, new you know what I mean? Fresh mind state. You know, he wants to be free. He wants to be empowered. He wants to be himself. You know, um, meanwhile, Stephen, man, he had to do a lot of bowing and kowtowing to get where he was at. He was like, look, you got to be this way. This is who we're supposed to be. We're not supposed to be on horses and equal with this man. Who is this guy? Who does he think he is? So that was an interesting dynamic. Not only uh, that part of it, but also when they got um, into the house. And he noticed, he was the first one to notice Broomhilda making eye candy with Django. You know, that's kind of that uh, relationship, that, that, that thing where that dynamic where you have 
that guy, you know, he thinks he's doing everything right and he thinks he's doing everything by the system and he got a good job. He should be doing this and that. But that girl wanted a guy who's a little bit dangerous. He's living on edge. He's not afraid to fight for what he wants and he knows what's right. You know, and uh, sometimes he might do a little something illegal. Like you're a drug dealer, right? So she looking at Django like, uh. And then you got your boy, right? The butler, Steven, looking like, uh, she likes him. I know she wants him. He hating, right? He hating. Hating on the young boy with some, with some pizzazz, a little flash. All right? That's another dynamic right there. Another hidden relationship was between the dentist and Broomhilda, right? Because secretly, when I watched that movie, I, I've seen it several times. I swear, I still think the dentist would have hit that if he had a chance. I Man, he was speaking German to her, all this and that. And I'm thinking, like, you know, how does Django know what he's saying? He might be trying to push up on his shorty, right? He might be trying to push up on his girl. And that's what I'm thinking when I seen that part and um, called her beautiful in German and all this and that, spitting all this swag, all this game um, on behalf of Django. But to me, he had a little bit undertone where, like, you know, he's always wanting to hit it if it's possible. You know what I'm saying? I felt that's what I saw in that scene right there. And But you notice she had her eye on Django because as soon as he oh, uh, the door opened and he came out, she poured the water like, she passed out, <laughs> right? Right? He was like, hmm. He talked about it was Django's tongues or his words. I forget what the word he used, but um, that showed... A dynamic right there like there's always that play that corporate play for the black woman to you know to go you know to date the uh, uh the wealthy uh black guy instead of uh you know a guy who may be not making as much and don't have as many things like the guy was speaking different languages may not be this or that but um still likes her and so that was a good dynamic right there and she has a choice right of course she wanted to Django. so let me see here The black on black violence, the Mandingo fighting. Oh, come on. That was very, very graphic, right? Kind of reminded me of uh, what goes on in uh, the sports arena. You have your owners, right? And they just want you to go out there and work, work, work for the team. They don't care if you bludgeon the other person, somebody get a concussion, what goes on as long as they make that money. And they're like, good job, great job. And when he won, he got, you know what I'm saying, food got taken care of that he's normally not going to get. He got the booze, right? And he got the women, right? Remind you of something, right? Sports entertainment. If you do this for me, I'm going to take care of you, make sure you're living good. Everybody else looking up to that guy like, oh, my goodness. He's brutal. You know what I mean? He's strong. You know, he's powerful. But look what he's doing, you know, to get that power, to get that 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 influence. You know, so um, that was interesting right there, that relationship. So all in all, though, the movie, man, kind of talked about how, you know, it's hard to free yourself from the, the systems and the society the way it is to go live your life the way you want to live your life. You know, talk to, you know, it showed how difficult it was, you know, because Broomhilda was on the in, Django was on the out. He had to do business with this white man, you know, in order to get her, you know, from this plantation. And in doing business with this man, they, the man going along on his journey uh, with Django actually started seeing, you know, different things that he might not have seen or thought about. And in the end, he didn't like that Mr. Candy even, you know, so there was a standoff between Mr. Candy and Schultz, the dentist. And then you had the butler and Django, right? And so this kind of represents the struggle that we have in society with, uh, if you believe it, I don't know if you believe that there is a system that's a supremacist system and the racism exists or not. I don't know what you believe and what you don't believe, but that movie showed a dynamic between the racist white man and a good-hearted white man, and it showed a dynamic between uh, 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 the black man who's stuck and systematically brainwashed with the butler versus the man who's fighting for freedom. You know, those are very interesting dynamics to look at, um, that they had to do battle amongst themselves, you know, before this issue could be solved, right? Um, so that's very, very deep. And so when we have to look at our own cultures and kind of look at what we're doing in our own culture that's kind of holding us back or setting us back or causing us to uh, not see other races as equal uh, in this world. So that was an interesting dynamic right there in the movie. So that was a very, very powerful movie. There's lots of things I know I didn't hit. I just didn't want to make this video that long. But Django, it's a great movie, man. 
Classic, classic. Check it out if you haven't seen it. Hope I ain't ruining it for you. Um, if you did, watch it again anyway, man. There's lots of parts that you didn't see and you missed when you go back and see it again. Be careful. It's generational trauma out here. You know, get yourself taken care of. You know, tell somebody you love them. This is Fawn signing out from Social Climate.